far as, sorry, endeavor peace, I left out the last clause, as far as he has hope of obtaining it, of obtaining peace. So to the extent that this is a realistic goal, you should pursue it. That's in your own self. On the other hand, and when he cannot obtain it, when peace is not something that is available, then he may seek and use all helps and advantage, advantages of war. The first branch of which rule containeth the first and fundamental law of nature, which is to seek peace and follow it. And the second is just a repetition of the right of nature. So if we can't achieve peace, if we can't get out of the state of war, well then, this is just a reminder, we still have our right of nature. So the first half of this is, strictly speaking, the fundamental law of nature, the most important thing that we can do to achieve our most important ends. And the second half, second clause here, is just a kind of repetition of the right of nature, which we still have. So, the right of nature gives me a right to use my body for my purposes. It gives you a right to use my body for your purposes. But there might be a better way of achieving our purposes. There might be a better way of accomplishing our most important goals of staying alive than to just use each other in whatever way we like. So a better way would be to try to achieve peace. So Hobbes comes. Okay? And so that's what the fundamental law of, of nature tells us. And now I tell you that it's fundamental because all of the other laws of nature that he's going to talk about, uh, so he doesn't actually, contrary to popular belief, he doesn't actually talk about looking both ways before you cross the street. All of the laws of nature that he talks about are really rules to figure out how to do this. That's why this is fundamental. All of the other laws of nature are going to tell us what we have to do in order best to achieve peace, which is the most important thing we can do to achieve our most important goals. Questions about that? Okay. So here comes now the second law of nature which is going to tell us what rule to follow in order to do this, in order to achieve peace. <coughs> Paragraph 5. From this fundamental law of nature, by which men are commanded to endeavor peace, sorry, let me just pause for a second, they're commanded to do this, but of course, it's in their own self-interest. It's, it's like they're commanded by their own reason to do this. From this fundamental law of nature by which men are commanded to endeavor peace is derived the second law. Here it comes. That man, uh, sorry, uh, that a man be willing when others are so too, as far forth as for peace and defense of himself he shall think it necessary, to lay down this right to all things, this right of nature, and be contented with so much liberty against other men as he would allow other men against himself. So, um, on the condition, so here comes the second law of nature, which is telling us how to achieve peace. What the fundamental law of nature tells us to do. And it says, when other people are willing to do this, and to the extent that other people do this, you should give up your right of nature. So notice that this is, as it were, conditional. It says, if other people are willing to do this, to the extent that they are willing to do this, you also should be willing to give up your right of nature. 
So um, my first question is, uh, why is it conditional in this way? Why doesn't the second law of nature say, in order to achieve peace, which is what the first law tells us to do, what we should do is give up our right of nature. It doesn't say that. It says, on condition that other people are willing to do this, you should give up your right of nature. So why is it conditional in that way? So, right, so it's not peaceful, then you don't have any obligation to the other. Okay, so so the condition is if other so the what, negation of the condition is if others are not willing to give up their right of nature, you don't have to either. Why is that? That's what I'm asking about. Why is that? Yeah. So if you give up your rights and others don't give up your rights, you're just gonna lose their ego. Right. So this is this is not a rational strategy to better pursue your own self-interest, which is what a law of nature is supposed to be. So if you simply, unconditionally give up your right of nature and other people rely on theirs, this isn't helping. This isn't helping because now other people, for example, can use your body for their purposes, but you can't anymore. Well, this is not a strategy either to obtain peace or ultimately to help you better satisfy your desires. Others would say this was this would be leaving yourself open to become prey for other people. Okay, so you're giving up your right of nature and others not can't be a law of nature. Isn't a rational strategy. What about the opposite? What about you're holding on to your right of nature and other people giving up theirs? Well, look, if 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 this didn't work, or it's really bad news, that seems like it would be the best, right? I mean, wouldn't it be the best? Everybody else gives up their right to act and judge, sorry, to judge and act on the basis of their own desires. You retain your right. You can use your body for your purposes. You can use their bodies for your purposes, but they can't anymore. Doesn't that seem good? What's the problem? You'd give up the right to nature by like breaking the law, wouldn't you, technically? Like you wouldn't even have the right to use it anymore if you couldn't follow the... Well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting the possibility of you are not giving up your right of nature and having everybody else do so. I mean, they would band together then, probably, and take care of you. Maybe they would, but not if they give up their right of nature. Sure, yeah, I mean, okay, so this is another way of describing it, is you become especially special. This would be like subordinating everybody else's judgment to you. You become the king, or whatever. Isn't that the law is everybody's equal? What do you think? Wouldn't you then have exclusive rights if everybody else doesn't have it? Yeah. You become, you become the one that you only have the right to. Indeed. So what's the problem here? This is you're right. So this is establishing a new kind of inequality. But it's but if I'm the one being chosen here, if, sorry, if I'm the, the one holding on to my right of nature and you all are giving it up, that seems like a good deal. So I just said, and we just said a moment ago, that the possibility of you giving it up right of nature giving it up, giving up the right of nature, and nobody else doing so is a bad deal for you. Now I'm asking sort of about the opposite question. What about having everybody else give up their right of nature and not give it? It's a bad deal for them. It's a bad deal for them. They're not going to do it. Or at least not under normal circumstances, maybe under some special circumstances. But this is not accessible. Right? It's a good deal for you, but not for them. Yeah. Isn't that like essentially what monarchy is? Well, we're good. <laughs> okay, so these two possibilities of you giving up your right of nature and everybody else holding theirs, 
and you're holding yours and everybody else giving up theirs, these are not viable or rational options. So that means we're kind of left with two other possibilities. Everybody hold on to their right of nature, or everybody give it up. Yes? Okay. Well, so which one of the, if those are the only rational or accessible possibilities, which one of those is better for your own self-interest? You said if everybody's giving up their rights to nature and nobody's infringing on each other anymore, everybody's kind of in agreement, and it works out you to achieve peace. So Hobbes is, yeah. I think it would be if everybody keeps, keeps their rights yeah. from nature just for the fact that Hobbes goes back to saying how um, the state of nature, everybody is, it's brutish and mean and short, yeah. and you're only trying to survive. Yeah. So if, you, if everybody keeps the right, it kind of seems more accessible for you to use everybody else's bodies to achieve your goals. That's true. Giving up the right. That's true, but everybody else is going to be using your body to achieve their goals. And the result of that, he's argued in chapter 13, is that as you say, life would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, and therefore, for each one of us, bad. So it would be all or nothing, essentially? Well, that's right. So the two possibilities that we've just been discussing and kind of ruling out it are making exceptions for one person in one way or another. So if those aren't rational or possible, and what we're left with is sort of everybody agreeing to this together or nobody agreeing to this together. If those are our only two choices. We're left with a choice between staying in the state of nature or everybody giving up their right of nature. And his argument is it's in each person's own rational self-interest. Let me say that again. It's in each person's own rational self-interest to give up their right of nature on the condition that everybody else do so as well. Now, I want you to um, appreciate the apparent paradox here. What Hobbes is saying, so let's remember what our right of nature is.